Thank you. Well, it's the longest undersea tunnel in the world. And had they have only kept in tunnel to Ashford, it would have been the longest in the world, which is now, I believe, held by the Swiss. And the running tunnels were 22 kilometers long at sea. And uh, that must have been a world record at the time. But I know that now the world record has been taken by a tunnel in Yorkshire, I believe, uh, continuous tunneling. That one? That one. Yeah. <laughs> That's real. Anyway, this is what I'll be talking about today. The Ice Ages, which disconnected up from Europe. Ideas of the Channel Tunnel in 1800. 27 false attempts. Nothing is new in this world. Colonel Beaumont's tunnel in the 1880s. Final serious attempt in the 70s. Studies required for the present channel tunnel. It's construction between 87 and 91, and it opened in 1994. So we were connected to Europe by, sorry, this thing is me or, by the wheeled Artois link a barrier which land oh there we are lovely mm. you can see it but can't move it is it me or press the button ah there we go oh I see all right <laughs> oh, God. very sensitive anyway you can see the 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 wheel at link there. But that's the, the furthest ice advance, which created a lake being fed by the Thames, Medway, Rhine, and Meurs, and it broke through. And evidence of that breakthrough can be seen in the bedrock of the Channel Tunnel. Well, I think there you can see the Isle of Wight, and you can see a braided river channel being cut in the bedrock. Um, when I did my research, sea level was meant to have fallen about, well, I reckon 120 meters, but that was, seemed extreme at the time. But I know that recent research has in fact found that um, you can see glacial features um, in, in detailed hydrography uh, out to the, the continental edge, which is about 200 meters. So it's a major uh, advance, and uh, this is our great version, our great version of the Great Flood. Well, not surprisingly, as we know, it wasn't one ice advance; a series of ice advances. And as you can see, warm is red, blue is cold, going from seven hundred thousand years on the right to ten thousand years present day. And during warm periods, so you saw human occupation. You can also see it in this bed deposits. These are around the Channel Islands and English Channel. So you have the last glaciation, start of the last glaciation, about 160,000 years ago. Sorry, melt started about 120,000 and then what you're seeing here in dotted lines are the conglomerates and shelly beds, essentially storm beaches, which obviously can be dated. And this is showing in the variation sea level, which uh, along with Shackleton's um, figures for sea level. Well, interestingly, the Channel Tunnel started in the early 1800s. This is actually quite sophisticated. You're seeing here these machines laying units on the seabed, tunnel lining units which are joined together. And obviously that's obviously what we do today, things like the Orison link and also the Furman belt link is what we 
bury ours in, in, a, in a dredge tunnel and protect it with rock. They were just going to lay it on the seabed. This is another one, which is, as you see, Mathieu Pevier, Albert. And you can see here, he's lighting it with candles. Stagecoach is rushing through. He realizes it's not going to be waterproof, so he's got drainage here. And he also puts ventilation shafts up. However, I wouldn't like to be in the tunnel when that vessel came in contact with that shaft. This is much more realistic. This is the idea of de Gamond in 1850. And this is looking at France. There's an, uh, an air uh, allowing air in. It then went off to the Barn Bank, then off to the UK. So this is quite a realistic thing. And both these areas are well protected from ship collision. Now, it's been objected to mainly in all these 27 attempts by the military. And this is a cartoon from the early 1800s. You're seeing here the French with their balloons, which is quite advanced. French Navy coming across here. Our brave boys in the Navy fighting them off. Then you have these characters here, which apparently appear to be hanging from kites to drop bombs on the French Navy. However, as the wind normally comes from the southwest, they'll be dropping their bombs over Canterbury, I suspect. But the main, the main worry was down here. Napoleon and his lads coming on the Channel Tunnel and invading Britain. And that was the always has been the worry and always been the reason why the, the, the military have objected. Well, they didn't realize that Napoleon would have been driven back by people with shopping trolleys off to get cheap booze from Calais. This is um, the first real attempt. It was won by one of the railway companies at the time. What you're looking at here is there's Dover, and the idea, this is the railway line, existing railway line between Dover and Folkestone, down here, Folkestone. And the thing would go off into tunnel, oops, and come around and go off down the channel tunnel. The crucial point, crucial thing to look for here, this is Shakespeare Cliff Platform. And what happened here, that uh, before this, early, early 1800s, they simply blasted the cliff down to produce a platform, which they then protected, and they developed a coal mine, which they did find coal, but anyway, apparently the seams were very thin and also full of sulfur, so they abandoned it. But that's why we have Shakespeare platform, and that was crucial for all developments, or virtually all developments, of a channel tunnel. This is Colonel Beaumont, Fred Beaumont, um, you can see that he's, sorry, you see here the old coal mine, he's going to use, or he did use the shaft and went along the clay mile here, lower chalk, and going down, you see his men going down the shaft, uh, he had a tunnel boring machine, which you can see there. However, he appears to have recruited all his miners, I've never seen people like this <laughs> from the Athenaeum Club, I suspect. Anyway, this is another, this is just one of the tunnel boring machines, which this is a, a, a French one. And in fact, if you ever go down the big pit in South Wales, you can see uh, boring machines there, obviously for the coal measures. So it wasn't, this wasn't sort of new technology at all. The technology was there, some one of the, one I think it was 1830 that I saw down there. This is another illustration. You can see the the old old coal mine here. They're a bit more realistic. They reckon it might be a bit wet, so they're wearing raincoats in this one. But this is actually Colonel Beaumont's tunnel. He managed to get out something like. 600 meters under the sea. I mean, I did walk through this. It was in good condition, dry and in good condition. Sorry, 800 meters completed. 
and it was seven foot in diameter and it achieved 12 meters and 17 hours. That, must, that was the maximum. So it's pretty good, pretty good. And also this is excellent tunneling material, as you can see. It was, when I saw it, lined with a bent railway line um, and with boards behind. But the boards, again, were in reasonable condition. So this is our channel tunnel route. I won't go into the details of it at the moment, except to say you can see it's sort of W-shaped and down here in the bottom of the Ws, this is where they have the sumps for pumping. We had crossovers on the UK side and the French side. You can see where the meeting point was way over on the French side. And this is because the French had much more difficult tunneling as you can see, uh, much more folded, faulting. So that really slowed them down. They had a hard time. And here at the foot of Shays, uh, the cliffs here, this is where the Shakespeare cliff platform was. This is the last serious attempt, 1970s, which in fact I did work on. That was um, the tunnel boring machine going down. That achieved 300 meters out to sea before it was the plug was pulled on it, but that was for financial reasons. French and British governments were paying for it, and they realized they couldn't, so the plug was pulled. Now, British government called and the French government called for proposals. This is one of the proposals favored by Mrs. Thatcher, mainly because it was a bridge and people could drive over. She was very keen on driving over to France. Anyway, the cost of it was very much underestimated. And when they came to analyze the various bids, it was thrown out on cost basis, but there were a number of options put forward. So this is the timetable, October 85, closing date for proposals, 13th of August, concession signs, et cetera, et cetera. And eventually royal consent, 23rd of July, 1987. We in fact started work in 86, as soon as the concession was signed. As you can see, this is 1986, and this is simply a, an infrared photograph of the cliffs. Now these cliffs are green simply because they're all, they've been protected for a hundred odd years by the Shakespeare cliff uh, platform. And our, we built lagoons to take the spoil, which roughly in the line here, and we were only allowed to put our lagoons where the where the cliffs were already green, i.e. we weren't allowed to extend. And uh, what you're looking at here is obviously on the on the on the seabed are areas of, of cliff failure. The seaweeds, I believe there were something like 97 different species of seaweed found. In the early days, we did studies. There were something like 42 studies before we got a final go ahead to go ahead. Uh, but by the time the project was finished, I think there were 121 studies were carried out. This was a, obviously one of the crucial studies, which was piling trials, because the wall was to be built with in, in essentially 10 by 8 meter coffer dams filled with concrete. And so we had we did piling trials, trying various types of pile, various types of hammer, and we ended up with Larsen sixes and the ICE piling hammer. We also did studies of the flows in the channel, essentially it ebbs in this direction, floods in that direction. The flood is greater than the ebb, so any spoil that we lost would end up somewhere in the North Sea. This is a picture looking down at the Shakespeare platform. So you can see Dover at that end. This is the start of the platform where the, the railway line comes out of a tunnel. So there's the platform, but it protected the cliffs all the way down here. And we are wall started roughly here and around there, creating 
lagoons to put the spoil in. What you're looking at here, these are major cliff balls, and that may have been the blasting, but these are cliff balls. And when we were there in 1988, there was a cliff fall roughly where I'm standing, where the photograph was, was taken from, and that was 5,000 cubic meters, which is pretty hefty. But apparently there was one in 1912, which is 60,000 cubic meters, which was literally massive. But that's what these are. So these are details of the of the channel tunnel. But the running tunnels are 7.6 internal. The cut ahead, of course, for the TBM. 8.5, likewise, service tunnel 4.8, and external down to 5.4. And I think you can imagine how crucial it is to get these figures right. You've only got to increase over the 50 odd kilometers of tunneling a few, uh, we'll say 300 millimeters, and you've got a lot more excavation, a lot more spoil, a lot more concrete and grout. So it was all pretty crucial getting these figures right. There are crossovers, which is where you can go from the running tunnels into the service tunnel and roof, piston relief ups every 200 meters. We removed, or we had to deal with some 5.2 million cubic meters of spoil produced on the UK side. And the center of all construction activity was Shakespeare Cliff that small platform which we expanded once we were able to fill the various lagoons. So this is the overall structure of Eurotunnel. With Eurotunnel, obviously with shareholders who dealt with governments, who dealt with the banks, there were 57 banks financing it, and dealing with the contractors. This is TML, Transmarsh Link, which was six British and six French contractors. And the way the thing worked is the contractor would put forward a proposal to people called a maitre d'oeuvre. Now, a maitre d'oeuvre is a French concept, but essentially they're technical people who look at the plans of the contractor, who then pass it on, their comments on to Eurotunnel, who then get back to the contractor, who then come back again via the maitre d'oeuvre. Now, this turned, not surprisingly, it was not very efficient. So a lot of us who were in the maitre d'oeuvre ended up in Eurotunnel and we dealt directly with the contractor and essentially Maitre d'Oeuvre were doing checks, making sure everything was okay. Which is the, anyway, that's the reason I ended up as Chief Engineer Marine in Eurotunnel. I'm showing you this, this is actually the completed platform, but I'm showing you this simply as an illustration of how access was so limited. There was one, access channel down here, tunnel, down onto the platform, one from land. It was one vehicle wide, essentially. And um, well, that was the only access, apart from the train the railway line, and that's where the tunnel linings claim, come in. And what you can see up here is the remains of the what we call the gulag. This is where all, all the... Um, Miners were uh, accommodated. This, sorry, down on the bottom here is a cooling water, a cooling building, essentially. I'll come on to that in a minute. So once you got down this single track tunnel onto the platform, you then were able to go on at it A1 and that was supplying all the marine tunnels to France. So you've got the Runny Tunnel North, South Runny Tunnel North, and the Central Service Tunnel. And added A2 did the land version back to Sheraton and Folkestone. Late on in the project, we did have a shaft, which the men could use, but that was fairly late on in the project. This is a better illustration of the tunnels, I hope. So your running tunnels, your service tunnel, you could pass from your service tunnel into the running tunnel. This is the 270, 375 meters. 
And these are the piston relief ducts every 250 meters. And as you can imagine, the air pressure building up in front of these trains was quite enormous. So you needed these piston relief ducts to relieve that air pressure. Otherwise it'd be much, much slower going through. So we're back here on the geological section. It's all in the chalk mile. The chalk mile consists of 10% or generally 10% silica, 60% calcium carbonate and 30% clay, which is smectite clay. But, and that was, as you see, the tunnel was virtually always through that material. I'll just point out a couple of things here. One is the crossover. This allowed the north running tunnel to pass to the south and south to the north, allowed you therefore to maintain and in case of, of problems to, to isolate certain lengths of tunnel. So there's one on the UK side and you can see one on the French side. This is a, a TBM. <laughs> A running tunnel TBM, let's say something like 8.5 meters diameter. And you can get an idea of the scale from this character here. It was absolutely enormous. These TBMs were something like three, uh, 100 meters long. And one, I believe, had a cafe at the end of it. But this is the what, where, where I'm marker is now. That's the working end. As you can imagine that turning and that grinding through the chalk. This is a cross section so of that. So at the front end here, you see the, the, the rotating drum. The, the chalk fell down here, was taken up by the conveyor to railway trucks, which carried about 14 cubic meters of material back to Shakespeare Cliff, put into, into a, a sump and then taken by conveyor up onto the platform. This thing operated by having rams. Now the rams contacted the last bit of tunnel lining that had been placed, pushed the thing, uh, the cutter forward at, at whatever rate was possible. It was then withdrawn and you're seeing here a lining uh, erector then put in the next set of tunnel linings um, we had problems about 650 meters from from the cliffs because the chalk suddenly became very wet and blocky and they had to put on in addition to what you're seeing here tailing arms to stop uh, or to to prevent material falling and allowing them to continue so you can see once the once the tunnel is uh, these are in place the any gap there was is grouted up. They're also, as you see, they're grippers. This is the crossover I mentioned. So you it just allows you for from one tunnel to another, north running to south, south to north, on one on the UK side and one on the French side. Not surprisingly, the um, service tunnel had to pass around it all. Now, this is a picture of the crossover under construction. It's something like 165 meters long, something like 22 meters wide and 15.4 meters high, which I'm told is the equivalent of three London buses. And above the, the roof of this is happily something like three, 36 meters of in situ rock. The, crossover, which not surprising was called the cathedral, was excavated by this, these, these machines. And the lining was steel and, and which was gunited. Um, not surprisingly, the tunnel boring machines had to be hauled through to then start working again. But a massive, really was a cathedral. This is the French side. So you're seeing here um, 
spoil in a in one of the trucks about to be dumped into a sump. And you can see the chalk here is actually quite white. It was also very wet and broken. So the French solution was to make it into toothpaste and then pump it up into big lagoons near Calais. So a different solution to their spoil problem. Now here we are in 1987, at the start of work. You can see how small the platform is. You see the access road coming down onto the platform. And then somewhere here is the access for Adit A1 and Adit A2. This is, the, this is the start of piling here, these piling rigs. You, but it was a very small site. These, this, these are old tunnel linings from the 1970s, which had to get rid of. They had to get rid of, first of all. And this is the railway line, which is crucial, because this, this is where the tunnel linings came in and mat other materials. So this is what we intended at the time to produce a series of lagoons. The total length of the seawall is about 1,780 meters long. So the idea was to produce a lagoon at 1A, 1B, and then 2, 3, with cross walls here. Cross walls were again steel piles, but only filled with gravel. And they worked very effectively in filtering out material. There was no leakage of material through them. These walls are the concrete ones. This is late on in the project. We suddenly found, or they suddenly found that they thought that they wouldn't need to cool the tunnel until something like a year after it started operating. They did the recalculation and found they needed it immediately. And so we had to construct an uh, additional lagoon. And that was the where the cooling building was. You can see here, the platform is pretty well developed at this point, but how full it is. The spoil from the UK side came out, as you can see, pretty dry. It was put into trucks, dumped. It was only compacted in 300 mil layers between plus 11 and plus 16. Um, at the start of the project, we had our temporary offices up here. And you may recall in 87, the um, we had Mr. Fish's wind, which didn't exist. But um, as you'll see from this slide, it most certainly did. And that's what it, that's what it did to our temporary offices. Uh, happily, as you can see here, Bob McKim still working away. Happily, again, it occurred at night, so there was nobody in. So this is early on. You can see here the road coming down, single track road. You can see the conveyor coming up with the spoil. That's 1A being filled, 1B being started to be constructed, and that would be Lagoon 2 there. But it's very, very crowded site. And it was really a bit of chicken and egg. You couldn't reclaim the platform until you had spoil, and you couldn't produce the spoil until you had all these facilities on a platform, including the cement which was supplied, tunnel linings. So the sooner we, we were able to sort of complete the platform, the better. Not surprisingly, you had to remove material from along the line on the wall. And what you're looking at here is a small dredger removing material. This is the actual seawall. These coffer dams here, oops, sorry, were roughly eight meters by 10 meters. Some of them were 11 and a half. And once constructed, they had to be cleaned out. Divers went down, cleaned them out. Roughly, the, most of the wall was about minus five meters. So once that was done, Mass concrete could be placed, mass concrete containing uh, PFI. And uh, I think the largest pour was something like 800 cubic meters. 
in all there were three concrete pours so the first one would be there you can see a second one there and the third one here so they've seen the second pour being completed major operation pumping that concrete this is the Isle of Grain. This is where the tunnel lining units are made. I mean, these things here are large factories producing these tunnel linings, which of course had two different types, the running tunnel and the service tunnel, and two different types of concrete, marine concrete, and essentially land-based concrete from the, uh, going from the platform landward. But you can get a scale of all this. I think I mean, that's an, a railway. Oh, I thought it was here, isn't it? That's a train. So these units were made. They're then offloaded onto trains and taken to Shakespeare Cliff. And this is what Shakespeare Cliff looked like. So these were stored on Shakespeare Cliff. And then again, these these cranes were, oh, sorry, were transferred onto trains, which you can see down here and what this one is showing is one train coming up empty and another train going down with a full ring of tunnel lining units and cement for the grout so it was a very busy site the idea was to once the run, once the service tunnel broke through at Cheriton, i.e. the Folkestone terminal site, that this, all the land-based spoil would go there. Anyway, they came up with an idea of filling it with, with dredged sand, which was approved. They, what you're seeing here is a trailer dredger who dredged the material up from Goodwin Sands. It's pumped via this, which is a cutter suction dredger with bigger pumps. And they pumped it something like two kilometers over a height of about 30 meters onto the Shakespeare to the terminal site. And the only problem with this is that this is coming out, say, 15% solids and 85% water. That water being salt, that produced a problem. But we were able to take it away using a local stream and they did monitor very closely to make sure it didn't pollute which it didn't so it was very that was very successful it speeded up the whole whole construction and that's just a, a general picture of um the terminal Folkestone terminal if you've been on it you drive up here then down onto here to get on your train and that's a train going through, well, in those days, it'd be going through to Waterloo, but now, of course, it goes through to St. Pancras. So this is what it would have looked like during construction. You had, oh, sorry, two, two rail lines in and out, forced ventilation. Obviously, the TBMs were powered electrically, so you had the electric cables and other cables going out as well. When they, not surprisingly, when they started off, they surveyed it regularly and they had their survey stations against the, the concrete here, roughly where I'm showing you. And they did a separate check later, or after a few months, and they found that they were a, a meter out. And the reason apparently was because these their their positionings were on cold concrete and the air between the cold concrete these markers was in fact hot and not surprisingly also had very high uh, humidity so anyway they, they were shocked at the time but anyway they sorted it out i might just say one thing here that we did have a few deaths during construction most of these were down to the Sonny Walkman, which was popular at the time. They weren't allowed, miners were not allowed to take them down, but did. 
and unfortunately quite a few deaths with people with their Sonny Walkman stepping out in front of one of these trains. It was very sad. So here's the breakthrough, first breakthrough in 1990 of the service tunnel. And then in, in May, the north running tunnel was uh, had a breakthrough. And this is the final breakthrough, the south, which was in June, 28th of June, I think it was. These, these tunnel boring machines were quite incredible. The the north one achieved sixteen hundred and forty meters in a month, and the south one, right at the end, achieved nearly two kilometers a month. So really, really, very efficient. So this is a great breakthrough. When it happened, the um, main man, GML man, in a chase bid decided. Well, obviously wanted to go there, and he went down. With a, he thought he'd better take a bottle of champagne with him, which he did. And anyway, the security man, not surprisingly, told him he couldn't take alcohol down there. But when he was told that if he wasn't allowed to take it, it would be put somewhere very painful, he was allowed. When he finally got here, he found himself stepping over cases of champagne, which had been supplied by the French. So this is the final breakthrough. And I couldn't have, I shouldn't have said about the um, the Colonel Beaumont, but I don't know whether he dressed up just to look like one of Colonel Beaumont's men. But anyway, that was our man and the final breakthrough. We did have a few problems. That's it was the fire. I think was in early on during during its operation. As you can see here, the fire exposed the steel. And this is because the wagon was open and the lorry went on, had a fire. And of course, the, the train going as fast as it was just fanned the flames. So some of the facts, Eurotunnel have a 65 year operating session. So they're, well, 30 years in now, roughly. In theory, it costs 5.2, the cost was 7 billion. That of the marine works, i.e. the platform, was 60 million. Six, yeah, 60 million, which was peanuts compared to 7 billion. But I thought it's most probably still the largest uh, marine project, coastal marine project in the UK. At its peak, it's spent 3 million a day. Well, it employed 15,000 people. Quite, spent 3 million a day. I say 10 were killed, eight of whom were British. And these are possibly quite old figures now, but a lot of passengers and daily something like 400 trains carrying 60,000 passengers. That must be summertime and so many trucks. And it carries something like 26 of the UK EU trade goods annually. And there I say there were fires. There was one breakdown. However, nobody was killed. And that's because of the excess into the service tunnel, access into the service tunnel, and the pressure in the service tunnel was always higher than the pressure in the running tunnel, so no smoke could get in. So I hope I've told you, you learned something about the seven billion pound project, the geology, how the tunnel boring machines operated, the size of the tunnels, where the spoil went, how the lagoons, were built and they were crucial to the whole scheme, the chicken and egg. The layout of the tunnel and its two crossovers, the linking of the passages and piston ducts, manufacture of the tunnel linings on the Isle of Grain. And as well as using the tunnel, I hope you managed to visit the Sampir Sampaho platform. This is the old platform, which is obviously now a nature reserve, and it's something like 36 hectares. And I say where it all started, as far as I'm concerned, with Colonel Beaumont in about 1875. Thank you.